Okay, so I'm happy to start the afternoon. This is the portion of the conference where we have several speakers who used to be Texan. And as we fit Texas, his title is big. So Thomas Housel will talk about mirror symmetry and big algebras. Um, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. So, um, yes, thanks very much for the uh, invitation. It's a pleasure to give a talk at this um, conference dedicated to Nigel's mathematics. And as you will see, I mean, it's basically, I study also um, the Hitchin system. The um, My interest is mirror symmetry for Hitchin systems. And in fact, this uh, latest project has grown out of a joint project with him. So, um, so I think it will give a good, one of the aspects of Nigel's work, the aging system will be very important here. So also because uh, some of you have heard the first part of the talk, but not all of you, and I thought it would have been cruel for this other half to skip this one. I will um, give the first part uh, as usual to introduce these ideas of uh, how mirror symmetry trying to understand mirror symmetry for Lagrangeal Hitchin systems led uh, first in Nigel to study upward flows in the Hitchin system and then later how this led to this notion of big algebras, um, which I have been studying lately. So let me start with a um, um, very quick schematic overview of ideas from um, mirror symmetry in this re recent preprint, you can see more. Or, uh, and then the other one actually contains more about big algebra. So both sides I have written about. Uh, but this together, I, I haven't yet, uh, uh, there is nothing there yet. So here it is in, in this talk. So very quickly, uh, let me remind you some ideas um, which are at the base of what I have been studying. Um, again, it will be very schematic, so it, um, but it concerns the moduli space of G Higgs bundles on a curve for a, a complex reductive or semi-simple group G. And we will look at its Leblanc's dual, and then we will look at the Hitchin system on the two. And then it started uh, in my uh, work, in the joint work with Michael Fedos, uh, where we noticed the um, Stromingeri Oza slope kind of mirror symmetry present for PGLN and SLN um, Hitchin systems. And then we have uh, went on and made a conjecture um, about topological mirror symmetry, the agreement of certain Hodge numbers for these two moduli spaces. And uh, so that really was my, uh, so my interest for a long time, trying to understand Hodge theory of these um, um, Hitchin moduli spaces as to the character variety. Um, this particular topological mirror symmetry was uh, relatively recently proved by um, Michael Groschenik, Dimitri Wiss, and um, Paul Ziegler, the two of my students. Um, and uh, in fact, Michael Groschenik um, just recently got the um, uh, junior version of the Breakthrough Prize, partly because of this. So, but, but the point here is that this original as topological mirror symmetry question is settled uh, uh, by now. And then around five years ago, I moved uh, back to the um, core of the mirror symmetry uh, questions. And, and I, I have been interested in um, finding geometrical manifestations of this mirror symmetry, which um, should be basically with geometric Lagrange correspondence we have already heard about. Um, and then I am looking at things in what uh, Donaghi and Ponte call the classical limit of the, the actual mirror symmetry, which here would just be some sort of equivalence, the S duality of the derived category of current sheaves on one side of the um, mirror symmetry. And then there's the same kind of category on the other side. And the rough idea is that this Stromingeri Oslo kind of picture of the dual abelian fi vibrations um, should um, uh, make this um, mirror symmetry happen, at least generically, it should be given by Kurimukai transform. Okay, this is as much as I can 
really recall about this uh, uh, setup. What I'm going to use as a main motivation is a, is a test of a symmetry proposal of Kapustin Witten's uh, uh, work on, um, on understanding all these mirror symmetry, the geometric leg lengths, et cetera, in, inside uh, their work in physics. And they propose the, a beautiful um, intertwining symmetry operators on the two sides of the mirror symmetry. So namely, uh, we will look at Hecke operators quickly and, um, and, um, and the so-called Wilson operators. Both of them are attached to uh, um, dominant weights of the Leglas U of G. And that's a point on the curve. So we fix a point on the curve. We take um, an irreducible representation of the Leglas U group of highest weight mu. And to this data, first we at, can attach an Hecke operator. So it turns out that uh, these um, local modifications of Higgs bundles um, can be parameterized, the, the, their type can be parameterized by, by such dominant weights. And then using them again schematically, this is not uh, um, so easy to define. We would expect the Hecke correspondence and the uh, and, and, um, and the transformation of on one side of the mirror symmetry uh, acting on the derived category of current sheets. On the other side, things are better understood. The wheels on operators, which uh, um, this should um, be mirror to, are just simply taking the universal um, G check bundle on the mirror, on the mirror moduli space and uh, fixing it at the point C. So we have a principal G-check bundle now on the moduli space. And then we evaluate it in the representation labeled by mu. So I have a vector bundle, an object in the derived category. And this is a vector bundle, so, um, so I can um, tensor nicely with it. And you have a, a nice operator, the Wilson operator. And then this beautiful proposal of Kapustin is that um, these operators intertwine the mirror symmetry. So if I uh, do um, the mirror symmetry first and then Hecke transform my shift, then it should be the same as first applying the uh, Wilson operator and then doing uh, uh, the mirror symmetry. So let me show you, and this is what I will be concentrating on. The simplest possible test on this conjecture is to apply to our simplest possible uh, coherent sheaf, namely the class of the, the structure sheaf. We will start on the dual side, and then we will think about what this intertwining would give us. So on one side, we can first apply the mirror symmetry, then we get the mirror of the structure sheaf. So here we are guided to guess what it should be from, from this general idea about the generically it should be Fourier Mukai transform. And in Fourier Mukai transform, we know what the Fourier Mukai transform, the structure sheaf of the abelian variety should be. It should be, well, the um, skyscraper sheaf, the identity element of the abelian variety. And when we do this in a family, um, what we should get is the structure sheaf of the locus of these identity elements, which generically, at least, should be uh, the, what we call uh, the Hitchin section, this W0 plus, which we will introduce more carefully later. Um, and then we expect that this to hold over the singular fiber. So that's one of the expectation of we have about the mirror symmetry that the structure shift should go to the structure shift of the Hitchin section. And then I apply the Hecke transformation to the Hitchin section. This is one side of this uh, intertwining symmetry. And, and what the, uh, this uh, Kapustin Witten tells us that the Hecke transformation of the Hitchin section should be the same as the mirror of what the Wilson operator applied to the structure shift. So it is just this vector bundle which we evaluated at the point C and that the representation rho mu. And the mirror of that vector bundle should be um, the same as the Hecke transform Hitchin section. So this is our motivation to look at it. We want to understand 
So of course, what it really requires to understand, because this side is kind of easy, is to understand the Hecke transformations and also see what we can say about the mirror symmetry. Um, so that uh, will um, introduce us into this realm of thinking about um, Hecke transformations of Higgs bundles. In particular, we will want to look at first the Hitchin section, all the Higgs bundles, and then we want to apply these um, Hecke transformations on it and see if we can uh, check the, the proposal of Kapustin and Witten. And one thing about this Hecke transformation of um, uh, of the elements on the Hitchin section is that the result uh, we would expect to be uh, a Lagrangian subvariety. This operator, in some ways, we proved this was a Lagrangian operator in, in our paper with uh, Nigel. But uh, we expect this always to be the case that Lagrangian should go to Lagrangian. So it should be Lagrangian, but it's a particular one, namely, it should be an upward flow of the natural cease direction on the moduli space. And, that motivates uh, the next slide to introduce or discuss uh, these upward flows, and especially the ones which you can access from the uh, Hitchin section applying uh, the transformations on it. So let's discuss Lagrangian upward flows in the modular space. Now we will simplify our study, and we will just look at the PGLN X modular space. Um, and here we can think of uh, PGN and Higgs bundles um, as a Rankian vector bundle together with the Higgs field, which is just um, endomorphism uh, and then a one form valued endomorphism of the bundle with trace zero. And as it's a PGN bundle, so the vector bundle is only uh, defined up to tensoring with the line bundle. Anyway, there are natural objects, and then we can consider the moduli space. I usually study semi-stable Higgs bundles, and then it's a nice quasi-projective variety, the moduli space. And then our main interest, of course, is there to understand the geometry of the Hitchin system, because that's where we do this uh, fiber wise fourier mukai transform, so that's a crucial um, player. And in this case, it's very easy. It's just that uh, we take the Higgs bundle and compute the characteristic polynomial of the Higgs field, which was basically just a matrix with values in one form. So the coefficients of the characteristic polynomials will be um, tensor or in, leave in the tensor of these um, of these one form spaces. So this will be the Hitchin base, so the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial. And this is a beautiful map. I mean, Nigel proved it as a completely integrable Hamiltonian system. The base has half of the dimension of the total space, and generic fibers are a billion varieties. Uh, yes. And then, um, okay, so this is the Hitching map. And then, our uh, main um, tool to study the geometry will be to study a, another natural structure on this space, namely the natural cease direction, which can be defined just by scaling the Higgs field. Um, and uh, with respect to the cease direction, um, the, the semi stable moduli space of Higgs bundles turns out to be semi projective in the sense that. Um, the fixed point, uh, C, the C star fixed point set is projective itself. And uh, it's not projective the whole variety. So if I take a C star orbit, then uh, it will not necessarily have a limit in both directions. I cannot close the C star down to a P1. But at one direction, namely when lambda goes to zero, there is always a limit point. So that's what we mean by semi projective, these two. To properties to have these downward flows exist. Um, and uh, now, if because of this property, uh, we can actually um, uh, decompose the, the whole X moduli space into very nice subspaces. Namely, we take any fixed point of the cis direction. And to this, we look at what I call the upward flow. Um, those Higgs bundles whose downward limit is exactly this fixed the Higgs bundle. The downward limit is automatically C star fixed. Uh, and we just collect those which flow to or um, fixed uh, C star fixed Higgs bundle. 
And it turns out to have very nice structure, this subset, um, which we call the upward flow. It was introduced uh, in general uh, setup um, for a general variety. Maybe he only considered in the beginning smooth projecting, but all the uh, definitions were in higher generality. Um, and he proves that at least when E is a smooth point, um, then uh, we always know that the upward flow is a locally closed sub variety, which is uh, even nicer, is um, isomorphic with the vector space, namely that it mod it's modeled on the, um, the tangent space of the, um, the manifold at that point, uh, the positive part of it. So C star will act on uh, that um, tangent space, and then we take the positive weighted part of the C star action, and, and then we know that this may not serve a cis direction, right? The upward flow is by construction is invariant under the cis direction. And there's a C star locally called sub it is isomorphic with this C star um, space, uh, which is just a vector space. So it's, it's a very nice um, um, way to decompose the space into basically just cells. And it turns out that uh, because of or specific situation, we have a natural symplectic form on the Hitchin moduli space, and uh, which is a uh, um, homogeneity one with respect to the C star action, and that implies that the upward flows are actually Lagrangian. So this way, using the bielanitsky birula decomposition, we can decompose the whole variety into these upward flows, which are Lagrangian cells of the middle dimension. It's a beautiful uh, X-ray, if you like, of the, the Higgs moduli space. And, uh, and then we started to, to study these Lagrangians. And well, we will be interested in, of course, in the first in the Hitchin section and, and their um, Hecke transformations. But it turns out that one class of these uh, Lagrangians are in, somehow the, the starting point of all these investigations. And, and these are the ones where the upper flow actually is closed. So typically it will be um, not closed. So it's not a foliation, um, but it will be only locally closed. And then, um, and, uh, and, but the closed ones therefore should be important. And then we actually find them uh, very interesting. So we give them a name, they are the very stable Higgs bundles or their upper flow is the very stable upper flow if and only if it's already closed. So it's a nice closed now um, sub variety, which is Lagrangian and isomorphic to a vector space. Why is it nice? Many reasons, but one of them is that um, then if I restrict the proper Hitchin map, which I didn't mention, but it's another beautiful property of it is that it is proper to a closed uh, sub variety, then the restricted map will also be proper. And now in this very stable case, the um, we will have a proper map between vector spaces of the same dimension. We know the sister um, um, weights of how sister acts on both of them. On both of them, it acts with positive weights. Uh, and this properness somehow is very strong. It, it implies things like it's finite flat morphism, uh, only zero goes to zero. And that's actually uh, will be the motivation to call it very stable. Because if only zero goes to zero, that means the center of the sister action, the only fixed point. That means that on this upward flow, there is a unique element in the Hitchin fiber over zero, which are exactly the nilpotent um, Higgs fields, Higgs bundles. So being uh, proper, this map will imply that it is only um, the only nilpotent Higgs bundle on the upward flow is the original Higgs bundle itself. And then in that way, in the case when the Higgs bundle was actually as already a stable uh, vector bundle with the zero Higgs field, then that being very stable is exactly the same notion what Lomon in 1988 defined as a very stable bundle. He said the bundle is very stable if the only nilpotent Higgs field on it is, uh, is, it, is the zero one. And that is, uh, turns out to be equivalent uh, with this, uh, assumption about the upward flow from that uh, point being uh, closed. So it's very nice. And as so what we will find uh, 
uh, is that we have sometimes we will be able to have a very nice way to understand this uh, uh, map. So we will find in some sense coordinates where this map could be described um, explicitly in, in some sense, but uh, yes, so you will see. Um, okay, let me show you some examples. There's some of the simplest examples of very stable upward flows. The first one, of course, will be the, the Hitchin section. So let's then recall um, uh, the Hitchin section or, or these bundles which are on the Hitchin section. So first it will leave um, the the this this hitch this hitching this, this hitch bundles will leave on this particular sum of line bundles, um, and then for any point in the base, uh, we will pick a Higgs bundle whose uh, characteristic polynomial will be this point, and which one we take? I mean, there is a very nice one. We can take the companion matrix of this um, characteristic polynomial. And then we can make it a Higgs bundle. That's why we have to choose, by the way, a is zero or like that. So that this actually, this matrix actually gives a map from E0 to E0 tensor the canonical bundle. And then by construction, the characteristic polynomial will be this one. So we pick the exactly one point from each fiber of the Hitchin map. And um, this is what we call the Hitchin section. Um, the first we notice that the one at zero, when A is zero, when this is all zero, so it's just the nilpotent, regular nilpotent matrix is very important. It's what we call the canonical uniformizing Higgs bundle. Um, and then all these A's together, we can easily see they will flow. Their C star orbit is going to just clearly flow to this one. So all these guys in the Hitchin section will be in the upward flow of this one. And then you can easily prove that it's actually all the upward flow. So the upward flow from the canonical uniformizing Higgs bundle is exactly the whole Hitchin section. So the Hitchin section is one of these uh, Lagrangian upward flows. And this is closed because, um, well, because it's one-to-one, -one, so it's a proper map. The Hitchin map restricted to it, it's a proper map. Um, yes, so it is uh, the first example of a very stable upward flow. It's, I imagine this to leave on the, the top of the nilpotent cone, the top of the Hitchin's, uh, the Higgs moduli space leaves this Hitchin section, this upward flow. And then we will try to now make uh, Hecke transformations on, on these, uh, on these uh, Higgs bundles. So we, we, take, we will take the simplest, with the first part of the talk, I will be taking the simplest kind of Hecke transformations, the ones which correspond to so-called minuscule um, representations. And these are the fundamental Hecke transformations um, or elementary Hecke modifications. And this is labeled by a K, an integer between one and mine, and mine. So it corresponds to one of the fundamental weights. Um, of the Lagrange dual group. And, uh, and then you just uh, twist the last and minus K of these line bundles by C. So we will change the underlying bundle. That's basically what happens that at the point C, we take, um, a, um, I guess, a K dimensional subspace and um, do a packet transformation there. And that will be the, um, the result. And, uh, and then what happens with the Higgs field? is um, under, so we need, of course, always a particular Hecke transformations, only those where the, which is compatible with the Higgs field so that we get the Higgs field up there, the Hecke transformation. And the Higgs field, uh, the one over zero, the canonical uniformizing Higgs field uh, will be the same as before, except that the, the, the case position, the one becomes, uh, 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 acquires a single zero at the point C. So we take this section, the, the defining section of, of this line bundle, um, which uh, will exactly only go uh, at a simple zero at C. And, then, and again, it turns out that this is the right bundle to take to get a Higgs bundle. And this one is nothing but the Hecke transformation of the canonical uniformizing Higgs bundle 
at this uh, this fundamental hacker transformation. There is a unique one in this case because the regular and important uh, uh, fixed field will only have a unique k-dimensional subspace that it is going to to live in variant. But we can look at its upward flow, this guy, and uh, now it's going to be more complicated because on the we, it is a fact uh, which we use in our thinking that the whole upward flow from this is the same as the upward flow, the, as the Hecke transformed upward flow from, from the Dehichin section. So, but along the Dehichin section now, it's no longer regular Neil-Potent, the Higgs field. So I could have, and in fact, typically I will have n choose k different possibilities for the subspace. So you will get generically n choose k um, Hecke transformed Higgs bundles um, in the generic fiber of the Hitchin map. But what we prove nevertheless is that the upward flow from here is, is very stable. Um, I mean, you can see it in many ways uh, because in fact, it is going to be an other component of the moduli space. And again, it will be the top component of the C star fixed point set. So this upward flow has nothing above it. And that's kind of a very easy way, but, but the way how we did it, I think conceptually is more uh, useful because we proved that, uh, as I mentioned already, that this upward flow from this EK Higgs bundle is exactly the Hecke transform kitchen section. And basically because the Hitchin section was very stable and this one was a minuscule representation and we will discuss a little bit about the F.I. and Grassmann and where the minuscule um, Schubert cells will be special uh, because they are the only closed ones. Anyway, that will imply that the Hecke transformed uh, upward flow is still closed. So it's a nice, very stable example. And then we will see that we can actually describe the Hitchin map on it explicitly using uh, coordinates. Uh, specific coordinates. And again, the reason for the very stability, it has to do with the fact that omega k, the k's fundamental character of SLN is minus q. Um, um, okay. The, the, okay. I may say more about this minus q thing later. Okay. So then, um, and then comes this description, which was very surprising in the beginning. And it's still today, it was, I don't know, more than a year ago, maybe even uh, I, I had this, uh, we had with Nigel, we had, we, you will see something about ordinary cohomology of the Grassmannian playing a role. But then it turned out that the whole Hitchin map on this particular upper flow can be modeled by the spectrum of equivariant cohomology of the Grassmannian. So it, it is true because I can prove it, but I still don't 100% I mean, deeply understand uh, this, uh, why, why this uh, equivalent cohomology plays a role. But you will see at the end, we will see that uh, we can uh, model um, the upward, the, the map on the upward flows in the non minuscule case, non very stable case, we will have to take a so-called Lagrangian closure, but we can always uh, model those in the, the equivariant cohomology instead of a Grassmannian of other uh, fine sugar varieties. So somehow this seems to be a, a general fact that many of these upward flows or some combination of them, the Hitchin map on them can be modeled by the spectrum of equivariant cohomology. But let me show you, uh, quickly remind you um, equivalent cohomology, and then you will see that the spectrum of equivalent cohomology actually looks like a, a Hitchin map. So it, it works in uh, for any complex reductive group. Again, quickly you have the universal principle G bundle, and um, uh, we can um, first compute the cohomology of the base, and that will be your coefficient ring. So this turns out to be a very nice uh, ring, it's the it's a polynomial algebra. Um, um, the invariants on the Lie algebra, or the W invariants on the on the Cartan subalgebra, it's a polynomial algebra, and um, and the equivariant cohomology will have this as coefficients. And that's actually the main extra use of them. So there's much more information in equivariant cohomology than in ordinary cohomology. So now, okay, I, this is algebraic geometry, but you could of course do it much more bigger generally. But let's just say that we have an equivariant, uh, a variety with a G action. 
Then to this, we can attach the Borel quotient, um, the diagonal quotient of X times the classifying universal principal bundle, EG, and with the free G action here, and, the, and here the usual G action. And then this space, some infinite dimensional homotopy, it's only defined up to homotopy. Um, this is what we call the Borel quotient, but it's cohomology is what interests us because that is what we define the equivalent cohomology of, uh, of the, the, the G space X. And, and as I said, it is indeed an algebra over the equivalent homogeneous point, which is uh, just this polynomial algebra. And, uh, and then in one case, the, this um, structure of this A star algebra is very nice. It is going to be finite free if and only if the, equivalent, the, the space is equivalently formal, which is many, again, equivalent definitions. One is that I can read back the ordinary cohomology ring by specializing to the, uh, to the origin in the, the, the base space. Um, but also, um, I think the, another equivalent way to say this is that um, over the, the coefficients, this is actually free module. So that's a very nice uh, algebra. It's a finite uh, flat algebra over the polynomial ring. So this means things like that the generic, every fiber has the same length. So it's, it's very nice. And, uh, and now if you take the spectrum of this, and that's what we'll be doing. So we will take the spectrum of the equivalent homology, then we will have um, this map, which will be a finite uh, flat morphism, again, to a vector space T mod uh, uh, T mod W. And this now it should remind you of the Hitchin base. The C star action, there is a natural C star action. It is uh, just very similar to what we have on the Hitchin base. Positive weights, um, in this case uh, for GL, SLN, it's uh, weights between 2 to N, my N, 2 to N, I guess. Um, so it's, it's very much like the Hitchin base, somehow a local analog of the Hitchin base. And over this, we will have this um, variety the scheme fi variety of the same dimension, so it will be a finite morphism over this. So it looks pretty much like an Lagrangian upward flow, uh, the Hitchin map restricted to it. And indeed, in that particular case that I had looked at, uh, we looked at in the previous slides, this uh, particular upward flow, then the, the theorem is that uh, it can this the Hitchin map can be modeled when you restrict to, to that. Um, very stable upward flow can be modeled on the spectrum of the PGN equivalent cohomology of the Grassmannian of K planes in CN. So what this means is that we now apply this uh, construction above um, to the equivalent uh, cohomology of the Grassmannian of K case planes in CN. Uh, by the way, all the cohomologies we always take complex coefficients. We want to look at the spectrum as a complex uh, fine variety. And then we just uh, pull back this vibration to, to the, over the Hitching base. So we can evaluate in the Hitching base uh, in a characteristic polynomial at a point, and then we will get a, a point in, in here, in the, this model Hitching base. And then pulling back this diagram will give us uh, the Hitchin map restricted to this upward flow. So in this precise sense, it is what I mentioned, is that we can model the Hitchin map on the upward flow by the equivalent homology, in this case of the, of the Grassmannian. Okay, and the, the, the proof is, uh, really follows uh, this idea that I mentioned, that uh, you have to understand this Hecker transformation idea. And then the space of Hecke transformations is this Grassmannian of K planes in CN. So we look at the point C and uh, we'll take all the K dimensional subspaces of our vector bundle at that point. And uh, we will have to take those only which are left invariant by the Higgs field phi. And that construction we can prove, it's a called fixed point scheme. We can show gives the same thing as the, the, the equivalent homology, the spectrum of equivalent homology. So this will be a particular example of an affine Schubert variety. It's the only closed uh, affine Schubert variety. 
And uh, from this we see, because in this case, economic homology, of course, is formal. Uh, by the way, if the all the even, the odd homology is zero, for example, that will imply formality. And so all these varieties will have um, odd homology zero. So we will get uh, this uh, property immediately. In particular, over zero, which corresponds to uh, the intersection of the upward flow with the nail potent cone. So the scheme theoretical intersection of the upward flow, um, this one with the nail potent cone will be zero dimensional, right? Because this is uh, very stable. So the only nail potent element is at the center. So it's a zero dimensional scheme, but it turns out to be the nail potent cone actually has a multiplicity its components. And um, and then, and so therefore you have a flat flat point, and that flat point is actually the coordinate ring. Uh, it's, its coordinate ring is the homology ring of the Grassmannian. And this is what uh, I called uh, multiplicity algebra. General, if you have such a map, you can always think about the ring, the, the coordinate ring of the scheme theoretical fiber of the map over zero. And in fact, this already we managed to, this was the first step towards this theorem with Nigel. We managed to determine the, um, this uh, part of the, of the upward flow, the intersection was just the ordinary cohomology of the Grassmannian, which was already pretty uh, weird at the, time, at the time. But then it turned out that you can model the whole upward flow with the equivariant cohomology of the Grassmannian. So let me show you now how this uh, idea can be compared in the mirror. So you remember the motivation was to test the, um, the Kapustin-Witten uh, proposal and let's try to see what we should get on the mirror side. So on the mirror side, we'll have the universal uh, vector bundle and then we will take the representation in this case will be the case fundamental representation. And then let's see what uh, uh, what will correspond to the grass, the homology ring of the Grassmannian there. It turns out that uh, there is a so-called Kirillov algebra, which uh, can be used to, <clears throat> to define extra structure on, 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 the, yeah, on an irreducible representation, namely certain multiplication. So let's see how it works. So we take um, um, a, a, and a dominant uh, co-character of, uh, of G, a character of uh, the Leibniz dual, and uh, the corresponding highest weight, weight, uh, I don't know my own notation, this, this must mean a dominant, uh, because we now change from G to G check, it should be, we will eventually do this on the Leibniz dual side, but so this is a, a dominant uh, character then, because then we have this, uh, um, highest weight representation. And in here, to this, we attach this Kirillov algebra. So to any highest weight representation, Kirillov introduced this algebra, um, which is uh, the G invariance in the tensor product of the polynomial algebra, well, on G or G dual, uh, for us is more natural, uh, but with G, we always identify with G dual uh, using the killing form. Um, and so whatever, this is some algebra as it looks like, uh, but uh, we can actually think of this in a more geometric way. And this is how I think about it. So an element in the Kirillov algebra will be a G equivariant polynomial map, an algebraic map, not linear, but from G to the endomorphism of V mu. So this is just a vector space, but using the, the, the is as an algebra, we can actually multiply two such maps. So this will be a algebra. Um, and this algebra will be associative in general, importantly, to, uh, not to be commutative, but only an associative algebra. We can uh, uh, multiply uh, any such polynomial map with a G invariant polynomial on the base. It's still going to be a G equivariant polynomial map. So it will be also an H star G algebra. Um, then uh, we have um, Kirillov, uh, his first result, one of the first results he had when he introduced this was, he identified which ones are commutative. So some of these are commutative, 
And this is exactly the class of representations, which is called weight multiplicity free. So in fact, that was Ikiro's main motivation to try to understand the weight multiplicities in representations via some sort of algebra. And uh, this algebra is sensitive clearly to, to weight multiplicities because when there are any, any non-trivial one, the algebra is commutative and when there are multiplicities, it's no longer commutative. We will concentrate on the easiest class, the minuscule cases out of the weight multiplicity free ones. Uh, although at the end I will show you an example that will be not uh, minuscule but weight multiplicity free. Okay, and and uh, what you can do with such an um, uh, algebra, uh, commutative algebra, is that you can use it to define a multiplication on the on the universal X bundle in the case on the, in the corresponding minuscule representation along the aging section. Okay, so this was a bit of a mouthful. Let, let's see how it is set here. So we take the case fundamental representation of SLN. Now we have PGLN, and this is the Legends US side. So we are SLN. And then what we claim is that you can use this um, commutative algebra to define um, a bundle of algebra structure on the universal Higgs bundle in the, in the case exterior power of it at the point C. So this is a vector bundle. And we think of this living um, restricted to the each section. And along here, we expect, uh, we will see from mirror symmetry that we expect a bundle of algebra structure and here it is one. So you can use this Kirill of algebra to define a multiplication on the representation. So let me indicate how you do that. So first you do something simple. <clears throat> over uh, the each section or the each in base, they are isomorphic. Um, I have these uh, endomorphisms of this uh, vector bundle and each uh, element in the, um, in the Kirill algebra, when I push it forward along this natural embedding map, which is the, and the, 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 the ring of functions of the map we had before the evaluation map. Um, then you will get a matrix because this is a map from G to endomorphism vector space. I will get, uh, we will have an embedding of this algebra into the endomorphism algebra uh, over the over the Hitchin base. And there is one important property uh, of this algebra in the in the minuscule or weight multiplicity free case. This commutative algebra it acts cyclically on the vector space, and that means that we have exactly as much of endomorphisms. If you, we know the cyclic vector is always the lowest weight uh, vector, that I can use the cyclic vector to identify my algebra with the uh, representation. And that way you can see that it defines a multiplication on the, on, on the vector bundle. And, and that way you get, you can multiply uh, the um, sections of this vector bundle and you get the bundle of algebra structure. And then you get the dual picture here. We will see that we will have that using the same evaluation as before. Then, and you take the relative spectrum of the bundle of algebra structure on this over the, the Hitchin base you will get this model, this particular structure by the Kirov of algebra itself. Okay, so there it's, it's, it's tautological because that's how we define the multiplication uh, in the first place. But what's crucial here is that, um, is how we define first the, um, the multiplication. So there are these M operators of Kirillov. So these are generating, in this case, the whole Kirillov algebra. When I do this, explicitly, then I can write down these M operators, how they act on the Higgs field. So the Higgs field is going to um, play the role of uh, the, the algebra. Um, and, uh, and then I apply to the Higgs field, these operators living in the Kirillov algebra, and that will be giving me this embedding. And uh, we use the cyclicity of this action to define this bundle of algebra structure on, on, on here. Anyway, so this actually may be a bit uh, abstract sounding, but in fact, it's pretty familiar. So if you have thought about the BNR correspondence, 
which here would be uh, the case of uh, k equals one, then um, then you do the same kind of bundle of algebra structure uh, to understand the spectral curve and, and later to, to, to do the BNR correspondence. But I am claiming here that there are also other interesting um, spectral curves, or in this case, just um, bundle of algebra structures on the universal bundle corresponding to any, uh, well, for now, minuscule representations. And then what's very nice is that these things match up under, um, under, uh, under mirror symmetry. So you recall that all motivation was to test this conjecture of uh, the mirror of the universal bundle in this representation should match the Hecke transform teaching system. So in this case, uh, we are looking at, it is a minus two representation, a fundamental, the case fundamental representation. Um, and in this case, uh, the, um, this, um, the Hecke transform teaching section in this case is also a, a very stable upward flow because it was a minus two a transformation. And so the result is just the, up, the, the, the structure shift of the upward flow, which itself has a shift of algebra structure, right? So any, you can multiply any uh, sections of the structure shift. And, and then when you start to think about what happens with the shift of algebra structure, when you do uh, puri mukai transform, it, it will be going to something more complicated or less obvious because um, tensor product will go to um, convolution product under uh, offline bundles. And so, so it's more complicated what shift of algebra becomes after fourier mukoi transform. But if you restrict the fourier mukoi transform over the identity, so convolving with the identity doesn't do anything. So in fact, there over identity, you will get a, um, a multiplication, uh, an algebra structure. And that's uh, what we see here. The, the X, we, we, we have the, the mirror of the shift of this shift of algebras, this upward flow, uh, which you can show generically is this um, um, vector bundle, but the shift of algebra structure will endow this um, mirror, the, the case exterior power with the bundle of algebra structure. Uh, which uh, over along the dual hitching section, um, and then that whole diagram, these these everything fit together very nicely. So here we have the um, the upward flow over the hitching base. We have seen that this is modeled by the equivalent homology of the Grassmannian. On the other side, we had uh, constructed this um, bundle of algebra structure so that it is uh, modeled on the Kirill of algebra. And then the two structures uh, match uh, as it should do by mirror symmetry. And in particular, you have this beautiful description of the Kirill of algebra that it is actually isomorphic with the equivalent homology of the Grassmannian. So this was pointed out by uh, Panyushev already back in 2004. He has an algebraic proof of that. We can now prove also this uh, geomet more geometrically, this observation. But what's funny though is that uh, Panyushev was not working on the Legrand's dual side. So it turns out that you have to work on the Legrand's dual side. Um, but of course, the PGLN equivariant cohomology of the Grassmannian is the same as the SLN equivariant cohomology. So in that way, it will be uh, indeed the isomorphic. And as you will see, this will generalize uh, uh, not completely understandably. So I don't understand this last bit in the general story, but a lot of it now I can generalize to any irreducible representation of the of of the of the Lagrangian like group. Okay, and so you can think of this somehow a classical limit of the geometric sort of care. Correspondence, but just to justify this, let me then now construct you the uh, necessary object, this bundle of algebra structure on the universe of bundle, but now any in any representation. And you will have to use uh, something inside the Kirillo algebra, which in bigger generality will no longer be commutative. But what we managed to find is um, 
is a, is a big commutative subalgebra inside the Kirill of algebra, which uh, we believe that uh, this will, um, I believe that it will complete the same story, but now for any representation. So that's the big algebra. So let's see, I, I give you the original way how I have uh, come first to as a conjecture to the construction of the big algebra. So again, the game is that we want to find a, commit, a, a, a maximal commutative subalgebra in the Kirillov algebra, which has all the nice properties to use for that's finite free, um, like the equivalent homology of the Grassmannian. Um, and, and then I come up with the following uh, original conjecture to construct this, or this algebra. So for this one, it has to study the Kirillov algebras. Uh, fortunately, the Kirov had several students who had done it. Um, so, but actually, all this goes back to his own uh, paper, this construction. So, we will write down a, a, a for, a, a some sort of operator, some sort of differential operator, which will produce new elements inside the, the Kirov algebra from old elements. So, for the construction, unfortunately, the way how Kilo does it, he takes a basis of the Lie algebra and then the dual basis uh, as well. And then to an element in the Kirillov algebra, mm -hmm. you can construct uh, another element which uh, is differentiating your um, matrix entries in the direction of uh, these uh, Lie algebra elements Xi. And on the other, the coefficient here, or we multiply it with the, um, what the representation uh, gives us of that, uh, of that uh, dual um, element in the dual basis. Anyway, this is kind of just a formula, but you can show that the result will be in the G equivariant. So it will be in the Kirov algebra and it also independent of the choice of the basis. So it is Kirillov's D operator. And that's nice because this one can be computed in the computer and that was important in the beginning. So we have um, <clears throat> um, elements, we already have elements in the Kirov algebra, the simplest elements, the scalars, when, when just take the identity element in the representation and any scalar in here, G invariant polynomial on SLM. Um, and then we have, uh, we, I like to use the, the coefficients of the um, characteristic polynomial as the invariant polynomial C2A up to CNA. And these are individually all elements in the Kirov algebra, the scalars. And they, they are kind of boring, uh, but uh, much more interesting to apply the D operators on them. And uh, interestingly, Kirillov has done it. He has uh, taken the D operator and that's exactly his M operators I have mentioned before. And this turns out to be a very important operators because at Kirillov as so notices it, that it is, uh, these are central in the, in the Kirillov algebra, these M operators. And uh, we call them medium operators and uh, the algebra that they generate. So I take the N minus one, um, um, medium operators and the identity, and then they look at the algebra that they generate. They are the medium algebra, they are in the center, but you can also prove that this is actually the center. So this, therefore it's an important uh, subalgebra, which uh, is also in the middle of our interest. And you will see that it will have also very nice uh, geometric uh, meaning. Um, okay, and then my little, uh, guess was here, um, I also actually probably already motivated by the mischenko fomenko classical integrable system, which turns out to be hiding in the background here. Uh, but at any rate, my guess was to take uh, further differentiation of the operators of the same elements. And uh, somehow they have the right number to generate the whole, to give us a, a nice big commutative cyclic subalgebra. That was one, one reason to believe this may hold. And then of course, the second main reason was that then I started to compute it in the computer. And any time 
when you take all these many, many operators, this is much more this one here. And here we will have uh, as many numbers as positive roots in the root system. That's the number of uh, uh, big operators. And they, I, I computed them in, in magma, uh, in quite big ones as well, even I think the largest ones, maybe thousand some dimensional representation. We have thousand some thousands matrices. Fortunately, pretty smart. And then you can check if these ones commute with each other. So this was uh, very exciting. And they are just they are cyclic, so they do exactly what I wanted them to do. But I couldn't prove it that they are even that they commute and. Um, so we take uh, now the big algebra will be defined by all these big operators. And um, and then, uh, yes, and then of course it will contain the first, the age one operators are exactly the M operators. So it will contain the medium algebra. And because it's a maximal commutative subalgebra as we'll turn out later, this must contain the center. So that's good. And, um, but then later, uh, with the, the back then my summer in them last summer, not this summer, the previous summer, Vlad, Vladislav Zverik, as with him, we managed to prove that it is actually commutative. Unfortunately, we cannot yet prove it explicitly or any, um, because everything is explicit, but the proof, as you will see, is using um, heavy machinery. And then you can also prove that uh, these algebras are cyclic, finite, free, over the base and maximal, where uh, I, I was just you just can you can, you can just use the uh, the properties uh, of what of these uh, golden algebras. So it turns out that what we have what I have defined here explicit operators, um, they actually live on some degenerated version of the golden algebra, which was uh, coming off from the so called Fagin Franca center in some a fine vertex algebra. Um, yeah, but, but these things are pretty hard to explicitly understand. So the, here, what was lucky that I had, we had this explicit form, which we could test in magma, but then we could show that the algebra of construction is going to uh, recover this uh, image of this universal big algebra in the particular representations. And what was very lucky is that these uh, algebras and the many, basically, or what I call big algebra are also more or less looked at in this paper, but they don't look at them as a whole algebra. They just look at the fibers of this algebra over the, over the base. Um, but they prove a lot of beautiful things about them. So for regular elements in the base, they show that it is a cyclic um, algebra, uh, which is very crucial that gives us this finite freeness over the base. Um, and then it, it is clear that it uh, is related to the mischenko fomenko integrable system because that's how in their work um, these algebras arise as the quantization of the mischenko fomenko integrable system. So what's surprising this way, you, I always thought of the Hitchin system as the not quantum yet, but it's somehow it's also, the big algebra is also some sort of quantum integrable system. Um, so this part, I still don't completely understand how the almost the same. Info. I mean, the golden algebra is some sort of quantization of the big algebra, so that's fair. But this part already has the quantization of the mischenko fomenko integrable system, so that's less less clear how the Hitchin system, which is some sort of classical, uh, can see this quantum uh, bird as well. Okay, so great. So we have this big algebra with beautiful properties, which basically come from their origin. And uh, let's see, the other thing I, I managed to find, which was really exciting, is that you can um, identify these algebras in the, in the equivariant cohomology of F and Schubert varieties. They turn out to be all of them have some sort of uh, geometric meaning. So that's pretty nice. Uh, it, it is the, basically what we did before, right? But we started the other way around. Then we managed to identify the equivalent cohomology of the Grassmannian with the Kirillov algebra of the minuscule representation. But it works for any, um, any um, 
highest weight representation, not just minuscule ones. So I just remind you this uh, I find Rasmanian of PGLN, which you should think about is this possible space of um, Hecke transformations you can do at a point on a vector bundle uh, on our Higgs bundles. And then this thing has a, what is it, a stratification or uh, it is a, it's a union of projective subvarieties. So we take um, some cell, some sort of cell, uh, and then we close it down. Um, and, and that closure is a projective subvariety in the affine Grassmannian, and that's what we call the affine Schubert variety. So we had seen one of these ones when, which was already closed, the, the Grassmannian for the minuscule uh, representation. Um, and again, here it was uh, kind of uh, lucky because uh, there was uh, the paper by Bezru Kovnikov and Finkelberg where they give um, uh, a relatively explicit uh, description of the aquarian cohomology of the of the Fn Schubert varieties, and uh, and they also the uh, intersection cohomology of them, which turns out to be important in the geometric Satake. Isomorphism, these are the ones, the intersection cohomology, which should be isomorphic with the representation for the Lagan zero group. Um, but they, they described the module structure, and uh, and then it was actually once uh, you, uh, you can decipher what they say, you can actually see that all media algebras, uh, which was the center of the Kirov algebra, is exactly uh, the equivalent cohomology of the. Schubert variety, so that's that's pretty nice. Um, cohomological interpretation of this algebra, which Kirillov got um, abstractly, and then it it continues very nicely because you can now think so the intersection cohomology, equivalent intersection cohomology of the Fn Schubert variety, um, has an action of the ordinary cohomology, making it a module. What what you should know, which is going to be important, this is not a ring, so it's just a vector space, but it is a module over the ring of equivariant cohomology. So I can take endomorphisms of the intersection cohomology, which commute with the, with just multiplying with the uh, ordinary cohomology. And uh, it turns out that this is exactly the Kirillov algebra. So the Kirillov algebra is just the endomorphism algebra of the intersection cohomology. That's another nice Notation of this abstract uh, Kirov algebra. And then uh, the best is that uh, as uh, MU module, so MU is isomorphic with the, uh, as an MU module exactly with the big algebra. So in this way, the big algebra, what it does, it induces a ring structure of equivariant cohomology, intersection cohomology of the uh, FI sugar variety. It doesn't have Theoretically, a ring structure in general, you cannot, there's no chemical ring structure, at least um, in general, of a singular variety, but but these ones somehow seem to acquire a, a, a nice one. This one, the big algebra will define. And I conjecture in some sense it's going to be, hopefully, that would be an explanation of what we are seeing geometrically, and maybe a unique uh, graded algebra structure on, on, on this uh, graded vector space. And then I hope uh, that um, this will um, put to, can be put together and to uh, have the same picture using the big algebras. The, the problem is going to be that I, I believe we will be able to understand the role of the medium algebras, the equivalent component of the Grassmannians. They should be describing the Hitchin map on the um, so-called Lagrangian closure of the upward flows. Uh, but in general, we want this um, big algebra, which has weight multiplicities in general, and that will give us a bundle of algebra structure on those. So this is still a bit mysterious, and I don't yet understand how it, sh it should be going. Anyway, so that would be the end of my talk usually, but I have now prepared one more slide, and then at the end I would like to show you some pictures. I don't know how am I doing with time. Oh, I see Danny standing up. Meaning what? How many minutes can you stand? Negative five. Okay, so let's do that. 
So I just very quickly wanted to define these skeletons and I just wanted to show you these pictures, okay? Uh -huh. So the skeleton is just the base change to the principle SL2. And I would urge people who are interested in the Hitchin system to think about the Hitchin system over the principle SL2 because it's going to be very nice, I believe. So the big algebra with base change to here, and then we will have the principal big and medium algebras. The nice thing about it, it is just a curve, a one-dimensional object, which has very simple structure. They live over this base, one-dimensional space of weight two action, and it will have components, two kinds of components, uh, spikes and parabolas, that the action, you know, the map is like this. And then, we see that the C star action, we have the minus one part, we'll fix the base and we'll fix the spikes, but we'll swap with the two sides of the parabolas. Anyway, it has very nice properties. Let me finish by showing you some pictures. Uh, this would have been the very end of the picture, but here you can see an example of a medium algebra. It's skeleton where we base change the medium algebra. This is for the decuplet the third uh, symmetric power of the standard representation of SL3. And then when I computed the medium algebra, you get this, or the big algebra in this case, two relations, quite complicated. But I wanted to draw something which I can 3D print. So I intersected those surfaces and I get the skeleton there. Let me show you the skeleton. And then I was watching, looking at this skeleton uh, for a week, it's already kind of nice, and somehow it it has information, a lot of information preserves from that. But look at what happens if you intersect it with the level set of C to zero. It turns out that the skeleton, the medium skeleton, is precisely described by the weight diagram of the representation. And this is very visual, really beautiful and exciting. And this way, actually, you can guess and then prove that the medium skeleton is always constructed from the weight diagram of the representation by adding these spikes and parabolas. Okay, so I showed my picture. This is my last picture from my inaugural talk. I gave two years ago and now it's even more justified. I was back then only seeing this Lagrangian closure business, but now I see that the whole weight diagram is somehow inside the Hitchin system. Thank you. So